I am a princess, goddaughter to another queen. I will use the spotlight and bring the fight. A royal rebel, defiant in the face of injustice. Together, we march. We shall be heard. We will be equal. Deeds, not words. The 18th of November, 1910. A group of defiant women face a wall of policemen, a thousand of them. The fight for equality has led to violence. A young woman steps into the fray to save a fellow suffragette from a brutal assault. The woman is Sophia Dilip Singh, goddaughter to Queen Victoria, granddaughter to the Lion of Punjab. But what brings Sophia to the front line in this battle to give British women the vote? How has this princess of the Punjab, whose family has lost everything to the British Empire, find herself in England as an Edwardian lady? Sophia Dilip Singh is the youngest daughter of Maharaja Dilip Singh, the last ruler of the Sikh Empire. He comes to the throne at the age of five, but very soon the British have designs on his kingdom. He's only 11 years old when they take away his mother. They force him to sign a treaty which gives away everything, his kingdom, his future and his diamond. He's the little boy without a home. He's the little boy who will eventually end up in exile here in Great Britain. As the youngest daughter of a family which has lost everything, Sophia Dilip Singh stands kind of on the precipice of almost having everything. Sophia grows up in a place of almost luxury. She has a home on the border of Norfolk and Suffolk, a place called Elverdon. It's a madhouse. Outside, there are leopard pens just near the nursery. The trees are filled with colorful jeweled parrots who fall out of the sky because they're from India, they don't like the weather here. Inside though, open the doors and you're exposed to a Mughal palace, the kind of place that Duleep Singh will never see again, the Lahore of his childhood. Things start going wrong when Sophia is about seven years old because his bills aren't being paid anymore. He somehow, he's not really a member of the royal family at all, even though he's been led to believe he is and he's loved. So he hatches this crazy plan. He's gonna retake his kingdom. He's going to go back and the Tsar will come up from Russia and together they will pincer out the British from the north. The thing is, he doesn't get past Aden. And Sophia de Singh is nine years old when, along with the rest of her family, they are arrested on a boat trying to make its way back to India. It's the beginning of a really interesting arrest record. After the arrest, Dilip is consumed with ideas of taking back India and he hasn't got time for a family. So he does something that is actually awful. He cuts them off. He has no more to do with them. He sends them back to England with nothing because he is obsessed with getting justice. The glittering boy king meets the most miserable end. He dies bankrupt and all alone on the floor of a dirty Parisian hotel. It's left to Sophia's godmother to step in, and Queen Victoria does. She grants her and her sisters a grace and favour house here at Hampton Court Palace. It's known in the area as Faraday House. After her coming out at Buckingham Palace, Sophia spends her 20s working really, really hard to become completely and utterly vacuous. Sophia de Leipzig becomes the party princess. <laughs> Not only does she wear beautiful dresses and go dancing at all the parties that matter, she scandalizes society by becoming one of the first women to ride a bicycle in public. Now that doesn't sound like much these days, but back then, it was deemed a little bit too anatomically exciting for a woman to ride a bicycle. Sophia doesn't care. She does it in the world's glare.
1903 marks perhaps the greatest party the world has ever known. It's for Edward VII's coronation. It's in India and it's known as the Delhi Dobar. Of course, the enamel on Sophia's teeth are itching to get an invitation. The India office don't want any Duleep Singhs in India. The thought is that even having them there might stir up some rebellion, some memories of what was done to the boy king. And so they say no point blank to the brothers, but to the sisters they say, not yet. Well, not yet isn't a no. So the sisters sneak on different ships and they go there anyway. When she goes to Lahore, she sees for the first time everything that's been taken from her family. She sees a statue of her godmother, but nothing to her father, nothing to the lion of Punjab, her grandfather. More than that though, she sees poverty. She sees how much is going into the coffers of the empire. And for the first time, she starts to ask, is this fair? It's like her eyes open, it's like her ears open. And what she hears is this call from the nationalists that's just starting in India. Avazdo, Avazdo, give us a voice, give us a voice. When she comes back to England, it's just not enough. The parties, the life, the champagne and the dancing, it just doesn't have any meaning anymore. She's a woman on a mission, but she hasn't found her cause yet. And then she hears the voice of the suffragettes. And what are they saying? They're saying, give us a voice. Give us a say in our destiny, in our future. And it's exactly the same plea she's heard from the nationalists in India. Sophia loved the fact that the women's suffrage movement were not taking no for an answer. What's more, the head of the WSPU, the more militant wing of the suffragette movement, was an incredibly charismatic woman called Emmeline Pankhurst. Sophia is drawn to her like a small planet to a big star. And Emmeline sees in her the potential for enormous propaganda. But wouldn't this be amazing? to deploy Sophia like a grenade. The daughter of a Maharaja, goddaughter of Queen Victoria, front and center in the battle for women's votes. She started off small in her fight for the suffragettes. She made jam and chutney. She never did. I don't think she even knew the way to the kitchen. But supposedly, these are little jars made by a princess to raise money for the suffragette cause. It wasn't enough. So then she starts selling copies of Votes for Women right outside Hampton Court Palace, winding up everybody in the neighbourhood. But it wasn't enough. So she starts recruiting suffragettes, inviting them to her Faraday home. But it's not enough. They drive press carts through London to the roughest parts of town. Sophia doesn't just go along to these on the press cart. She drives the press cart. But even that's not enough. So she stops paying her taxes. You can go to prison for that. She doesn't care. Bailiffs come to her house. They start taking her jewelry. Even that isn't enough. It is the day of the King's speech. Asquith is coming out of number 10 Downing Street. It was different then. You could go right up to the door. Nobody notices or cares that this very finely dressed woman is at the door. They notice, though, when Asquith is getting into his car and she hurls herself at the window, smashing a Votes for Women pamphlet right against his window. This is a woman who is absolutely hell-bent on getting arrested and sent to prison. There Sophia is with Emmeline and the other rock star suffragettes, the leaders of this movement, kettled by the gate in Parliament. And she sees this woman being picked up and hurled against the pavement. And the woman gets up, like all the suffragettes, they don't stay down. So she gets up again, she's picked up and hurled. Sophia, five foot nothing of her, manages to sneak through the kettle. And she runs in between this big police officer and this small woman who is losing consciousness and body checks him out of the way. So the police officer lets her drop and tries to disappear. This is a woman in the magazines. She's quite famous, don't really want to be involved in this. So she follows him into the middle of a riot, getting pushed and shoved and kicked and punched as she goes, screaming at him, show me your number, show me your number. And it's only when she catches sight of it, V700. 
that she's content to let him go. On the eve of World War I, the suffragettes have a choice. Either they keep fighting the British state or they get behind the war effort. Sophia swings into fundraising mode again, specifically to raise money for the Indian troops, some of the first who were sent into the trenches of the Western Front. But she also wants to do more. So she puts on a nurse's uniform. She heads to Brighton, where she's going to work with her hands and everything else that she has to put together their broken bodies. In 1948, age 71, Sophia dies peacefully in her sleep. And what's her legacy? Sophia was one of those people who just didn't take no for an answer. She was never meant to be a warrior. She was never meant to be a political figurehead. But she saw something that was unjust, and she put everything on the line for it. In the words of Sophia Deep Singh, I have done my part. Those who come after me will continue the fight. 